Work at all. All right, the fresh thing will disappear too. Hello, welcome to the so uh, it's my pleasure today to have a foreign guest after a while, actually physically. <laughs> physically, they come on the online. And uh, Florian Etel uh, came from Vienna, and he's going to talk about the pollinators uh, and flowers. And actually, uh, we would like to go also to a pub for dinner to grind at 6 p.m. So whoever would like to join him, please let know to some people so we can move the table for you guys. Well, so in Grainska at 6 uh, for further discussions, if uh, required, or any other chats. Okay, and now the floor is yours. I don't have any other announcements today. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for having me here. Thank you for the good pizza. Quite hot, <laughs> which I'm used to actually, because I'm working in Central America ma mainly, which I will tell you. Um, my talk is about, um, it's called From Foe to Friend, so From Enemy to Friend, about the um, recently discovered system which gives an evidence for the recruitment of florivores as pollinators. I'm at the end of my PhD studies at the University of Vienna and co-supervised by University of Salzburg. And I'm working where I did my field work is the tropical feed station La Gamba in Costa Rica. We'll show you where the place is. Um, my uh, research started with aeroids already during my master thesis. And I also need to say that I was about 10 years ago, I was with Connor and Santico and Wojta in Borneo in a tropical biology course. And that was very inspiring and kind of shaped my later work also, which I did there also working with aeroids with um, alopecia pollination in, during the course. So the, the aeroids, a plant family I really like, it is um, also called like, the arum lilies. You probably know most of these um, plants here from your euro or from the living room. So philodendron and anturium, these are the, the largest genera in, in the aeroids. It's about uh, around 4,000 species known from more than 100 genera. And some of them, also occurring in New Guinea, which is an um, epipremnum, but most things, and, and another page but most, most species actually occur in the neotropics. Um, they are herbaceous, so they're not forming trees, but um, quite beautiful leaves and beautiful inflorescences. That's why they are well known. Um, native to Central Europe, you might know uh, arum, and stinks a little bit like like dung, like cow feces, and um, pala palustris. It's also occurring in in Central Europe in swamps. Still, the pollination of cala palustris is a little bit a miracle. From arum, it's known um, they are attracting little flies, which are um, dumb because they think it is a cow feces. They try to lay their eggs there. They are attracted by the scent and then they are trapped. So it's a trapping inflorescence. And the, the duckweeds. So you might know in the ponds, there's little small leaves. Yes, they are also aeroids. And a tropical rainforest um, all over the world is without aeroids would look quite different. 
there are a lot of um, climbers within the aeroid. So here you see two, two like a tree full with philodendrons and turiums. Here another philodendron. So it is um, one of the most abundant um, family in tropical rainforests. They have um, maybe not so many different species like orchids, but they are omnipresent there. And the pollination biology um, is the thing that I have studied within the aeroids. And the general feature is insect pollination. So I'm working a lot with insects. There are diverse pollination strategies known. For example, the orchid bee pollinated perfume flowers. You might have heard of them, these metallic bees. Their, their males collect perfume from mainly orchids, but there are several anturium and spatifilum species. They are also collecting the floral scent from these and pollinate them. Then you have um, beetle pollinated rendezvous sites, which I will focus during the talk. So beetles meet there to copulate. And these fly pollinated deceptive systems like the Arum in Central Europe, which is a mimicry system. And there are also um, fermenting fruit mimicry systems, um, carrion mimicry systems, and this feces mimicry systems known in the areas. But the interesting is, and important to say, that only for around 200 species from 60 genera in the aeroids, in this large family with more than 4,000 species, the pollination is, or at, at least the floral visitors are known. So that means um, 95 species and half of all the genera are not studied at all. Nobody looked at the, the pollination systems or the pollinators. And within this 5% of all the 4,000 aeroid species, it is still unclear often if these um, noted or visitors are actually the pollinators or just some random visitors, like, for example, floribus. Um, another important thing to say is that most of them, actually, almost all of them, use very strong floral scents to attract their, their insects, their pollinators. Known from the Titan Arum, maybe you have seen it in any botanical garden. It was actually flowering in, in Vienna last year, and it really smells like uh, carrion. So uh, for two, two nights, it's completely punch and stench. And then you have this Anturium, which I already mentioned, with the perfume flowers. They smell very good, like chewing gum or um, some washing powder, very pleasant scents, but very strong. So you can smell them from a few meters, like, like a bush of, um, of um, a nice flower here, which is uh, flowering in spring. These little inflorescences can produce this strong scent. And um, some of them, not all, also use thermogenesis, which is a heating in the inflorescence, which occurs only during this time when the scent is produced. So they boost the scent with this temperature. Um, shortly, shortly introducing the inflorescence type we are talking about, because this is um, not one single flower which you have seen here, it's always an inflorescence, and you have basically these bisexual flowers with open spata. So here you have the spadix full with little flowers, hundreds of flowers densely packed together. And the spate that can have here, for example, no special function. Um, in the beginning, it's a little bit of a, of a protection from the, for the buds. But then in anturium, for example, there's no function known. And then you have the other type of inflorescences, which we will focus today where you have unisexual flowers. So you have, it means here you have hermaphroditic flowers all over the spadix. And here you have a male zone and a female zone. So here you have only female flowers. Here you have the male flowers. And then you find often a sterile zone in between, which can have different functions. For example, food bodies for insects, or like in the arum, 
um, imprisoning flowers which work like cell, uh, like a, a prison cell. So, and here the, the spater, you see an example of a philodendron, the spater forms a pollination chamber. So like in our room where the flies are trapped, the trapping inflorescences, or in the Titan room where you have this huge um, floral chamber. And if you cut it open, yeah, it looks like this here, just like the picture, the sterile flowers and the female flowers. So the insects go inside. This is also called the pollination chamber. And you have always these two phases. You have first a female phase that can last from one day to a week, and then you have a longer male phase, one, two days, or also a week. So they're all prot protogenous. So you have first female, then male phase. So enough for this um, introduction. My PhD thesis um, is about pollination systems in neotropical rainforests mainly, and um, working with beetles, bees, and some, some other weird insects, which I will show you also. Um, where's the tropical feed station La Gamba in Costa Rica, Central America? And here in the south of Costa Rica, almost at the uh, border to Panama, there's a Golfo Dulce region, which is a very warm Gulf. And here uh, is one biodiversity hotspot. So it's called one of the 10 world biodiversity hotspots. The National Park Corcovado is especially known. And there's a project from Austria. That's why there's a field station. It's a reforestation project, which connects this national park with another one and with the mountain range. And it's very wet there, so you have like 10 times the rainfall like in Vienna. And it's a tropical lowland rainforest where I'm situated. So this pollination system with the beetles that I told you, which is um, well, uh, what I work with. So you have um, about like 1,000 species in the neotropics from Central to South America, which are pollinated by these beetles here. But they are quite large beetles, almost like a main beetle. They belong to the dynastine, so the, the rhinoceros beetles. And they are known to, to pollinate palms, aeroids, um, some anonesi, nymphaceae, so the, the water lilies. And this is a very old pollination system. And they play a significant role in the pollination of these neotropical plants. But always, these pollination systems take place at night. That's why they are not so well known like others and not so well studied. All these genera here, for example, are pollinated by these beetles. As far as is known, all philodendron species, which have about um, 700 uh, species described, are pollinated by this and several other genera. How does this pollination system work? So you have um, the female face, like always, this is the first day with the female phase, and you have an um, increase of heat here up to more than 10 degrees to the ambient air. This heats up and produces during this thermogenesis, which you also can, you can actually feel it. You touch the spadix, it's quite warm. The maximum, which is known, is about 45 degrees. So that's really warm. You can feel it. Um, in this case, uh, this plant, which I show here, has about like 35, 36 degrees. So um, you can see it with an infrared camera. And then, when always, when this heat peak occurs, you have a strong scent emission. So you really smell this from far away. And it's mostly pleasant scents. No awful, stinky stuff like the Titan Arum, but pleasant scents. And these scents, attract several insects, especially the pollinators here, which are these cyclocephala beetles. They, in this case, two or three species per, um, per species of, of aeroids. And then they immediately walk inside. So they land there, you see here, this is an infrared video. You see here a lot of bugs, florivorous bugs, which I will tell later on. And there is the pollinator. It's landing there. It's completely dark, only finding it by their, by their sense of smell, and then crawling immediately into the 
pollination chamber where most of his life and most of the important things take, take place for these beetles, it's the rendezvous site. So these beetles do not meet by um, pheromones or usually other insects are meeting by some um, lacking sites or so. No, they are meeting inside these inflorescences. So they actually replaced at least the long range pheromones with floral scents. So for them, the floral scent is the important thing which they have to, to smell each night. And then they meet within these inflorescences where they find everything they need for the life cycle. They have uh, here the copulation, copulation pattern. They have here this, um, so you, what you see here, these yellow things are the female flowers. And here in this uh, special case, they're surrounded by staminoids, so sterile male flowers, which are um, actually here food bodies. You can also see already see they have they were feeding here, so they stay here for the whole night, feeding on the staminoids, contacting here the stigmas, and what you see is they are fully covered with pollen already when they arrive. Sticky pollen, uh, like a toothpaste. Remember this picture for later. And um, yeah, it can be up to 10 beetles inside. It's a little beetle party there. And also small other insects are coming there, visiting, which um, usually have no role in the pollination process. And then after one night of a party, then during the day, they kind of sleep inside. Here's another picture of um, what the floral fruit bodies can look like. And after they were there, so this is usually all eaten up but they're not destroying anything more in these inflorescences. So if you, if you think about a beetle, maybe chewing holes everywhere, this is not the case here. They restrict, restricted to eat these food bodies. The rest, the female flowers, the male flowers, they don't harm. And then during the next day, there is the male phase occurring in the next evening, usually to the same time when the female phase occurs. So when the scent is produced in some individuals, in other individuals, there's already the pollen extruded and the thing is closing. So they have to leave this inflorescence. While they are doing this, they are, have their force to go up on this male part to fly off, you know, like a little beetle crawling up and then starting to fly. They need this, this um, departure site. And when they're doing so, they are completely covered with this pollen little calculating a little bit more, and then they fly off. So you see here, it's really, they cannot go back in. This is closing, and then the party is over for these beetles until they find the next inflorescence where they can have another night. Here's another um, flurry war, it's um, um, an earwig. But you have seen the, all these bugs, so I'm focusing on these bugs, on these myriad bugs. So um, order heteroptera and the myride, which are known also from several other publications which um, have described the pollination system since, since the 60s. Or this is some species are known to be pollinated by these beetles and always mentioning these little myriad bugs, having no role in the pollination, but also visiting these inflorescences. Here, um, this was actually during my master thesis, we published a little paper about how this little um, myriad bugs called Niella sp, they, also this is Niella floridula in this case, they are attracted by the same floral scents like the beetles. So in this case, this jasmine, if you go to the field doing a bioassay with this floral scent, you will attract the pollinators and you will also always attract this Florivorous bugs, which are not taking place in pollination for two reasons, especially. They are not entering the pollination chamber here. So they always stay here and wait for the pollen. They have no interest in going there to the female flowers, obviously. Um, they wait here until the pollen is released and before they're already inserting their rostrum here inside these anthers, which are. Um, 
around these male flowers here, and they feeding and uh, destroying the pollen. That's why they are um, they have a um, negative effect for these plants. So they're destroying the pollen. They make little holes, which are um, seen later after their visits. And they also use it as a rendezvous site. They're doing the same, but, and the pollen is not covering their body, which I will uh, focus in a little bit. So you, you see here, the beetles already here during the male phase um, forced to go out and the myriad bugs as well. So um, in this little drawing, I will, Again, repeat what's happening. You have, you, you only see half of the inflorescence here, the other half comes later. So you have here the male part, which is producing the strong scent with a lot of scent molecules, which are known to attract these beetles and also the floriborous plant bugs, which we showed in this paper, that they are also attracted. And here you have smooth pollen grains, which are covered with a pollen kit, and they are adhering to the scar beetles. As you saw in these pictures, they're covered in this toothpaste-like mass of pollen, and they are entering this uh, pollination chamber, but only the beetles covered with pollen and not the plant bugs are in the pollination chamber here, feeding on the food bodies, which are present in all of these species that are pollinated by the scar beetles. Um, you have the heat production and the chemical attraction in the evening hours. It's always a nocturnal pollination system. So while I was studying several of this pollination system, aeroid species, because I'm doing here a community study, which focuses on the reproductive isolation of the species. And this, is, this would be another talk. But I found one species of a genus, which is also known to be pollinated by these scarab beetles. In this case, the species Syngonium hastiferum, a climber. You know Syngoniums also from your living rooms, they're a little bit climbing plants. If you cut them, they have a milky sap and the inflorescence looks familiar, right? It looks always like this here uh, on, a, on a tree. So this work is done in the lower, Canopy somewhere like um, 10, 12 meters. But suddenly I found um, again mirrored bugs, which was no surprise for me because they're always there. Um, they, they, they can change um, in color. There are several species visiting these inflorescences. In this case, a species um, with a red head. But now there were things completely different. First, they were attracted in the morning where no beetles were attracted. So during the night, this was completely empty. No beetles were there. And suddenly, you know, we have to go there every hour to, to visit these plants to see, okay, when is the scent starting? When does the um, pollinator arrive? Which pollinator? So I always collect the pollinators, the fluorescent. I measure the temperature. I observed their behavior and there was nobody coming, although it was already opening during the night, but no scent was, um, I could not smell any scent. So suddenly in the morning, a strong, pleasant scent occurred and lots of these myriad bugs were attracted and surprisingly, they had a different behavior. They were going into the pollination chamber and sitting on the female flowers also doing the same like they always do, inserting their rostrum into the flowers, the male ones, the female ones, the spade, everywhere where they could, they tried to get some sap out. And there were some of them, if you um, look at them under the microscope, you see pollen grains already from this um, species on their body. So, and what was missing here were the food bodies. There were no food bodies around the female flowers, here in this place where you usually have these enlarged flowers, there was, they were actually um, smaller than usual and there were no food bodies and no feeding of beetles occurring. And also no other insects. That was also the interesting thing. No other flora was only this. Can you see that now in the next day when the pollen is released, usually remember 
the toothpaste-like pollen that covers the beetles. It's very sticky and slimy stuff. In this case, it's a powdery pollen, which is covering these uh, this, uh, little myriad bugs. And they also are forced to go out of the chamber in huge numbers. They leave this chamber totally covered. Um, so the pollen release in the third morning and the dropping of the spata, so it's not closing entirely, but they are anyway forced out. And if you compare this now with a cyclocephalene pollinated species, like here, this is a philodendron grandipes, you see even if they are sitting on the pollen, which is meant to cover the scarab beetles, they, they are not covered in this pollen. If you compare them here, they are full with this. Even if you look at these uh, little bugs under the microscope, you will not find any pollen grains stuck on their, on their little legs. Um, so why is this? So this beetle pollen is it's a psylate, means it's, it's smooth, and it's covered with a pollen kit. Here also have uh, calcium oxalate principles inside, some dead pollen grains, and, and it's really a, a big mess, which is um, like, if you see, um, piece of dog excrement, you can compare it like this. If we step into it, it will be on our, on our shoe, hopefully. And if a little fly is on it, so it stays there. It's not um, on the fly, and you can compare it like this. So if the beetles are moving over it, it's covering their body. If the little bugs are on it, they are not adhering to it. Also in this species here, another syngonium species pollinated by beetles, you see the pollen is um, extruded in these little strains here. They are stuck together, like, um, like with glue, with pollen kit. And the, the, the mirrored bug is walking in between, touching it, but there's no single pollen grain on this bug. So this is the main reason why they cannot never be the pollinator in these beetle pollinated species. But the mirrored bug pollen now, that we saw covering this, this mirrors, um, is powdery and has little spines. So it's called echinate in this case. And you see, when they are visiting then the female flowers of a, a mirrored bug pollinated syngonium, then there's the pollen grains nicely on their little hair and they touching the, the stigmas. So they are perfect pollinators for this species. Um, the next interesting thing is that the fluorescent of Syngonium hostiferum was also totally different than to a lot of known scents of beetle pollinated uh, aeroids. And we had uh, found an unknown compound here, which um, is sometimes usually you find unknown compounds, but in the end you, you uh, work with NMR and you find, okay, this, this compound, but it's already known. But in this case, it was not known. So it's a new natural product that we found actually um, with um, this nice name. So uh, Mario, Dr. Mario Schubert is a, um, a chemist, very good chemist. He identified it for me. And then we call it um, Gambanol after the tropical field station La Gamba where we found it. And this compound um, was not available um, to buy synthetic so you cannot do a bioassay where you attract these, these uh, beetles or bugs like we could do with this jasmine. So we had another uh, PhD student working almost all his PhD on the synthesis of this product, which he um, at one point stopped because there were some, um, there were some methods included, which could, he told me it could explode. So he, he said, I'm doing something else for the rest of my PhD because at this point it's dangerous. So I went there. Um, I gave also a talk in front of the chemistry department in, in Regensburg in this case. And after this, we had a, a, a dinner and um, I convinced him that it would be worth to, to uh, synthesize this product. So he said, okay, I tried. Fortunately, he was not exploding and he sent this product to us. He could go back to Costa Rica and try out in a, in a biotest. So you see here, the inflorescence covered with these bugs. Here is um, um, 
An experiment, when you cover the infrared sense so they cannot see it, they are anyway attracted. So you show that without the visual cue of the infrared sense, they are anyway attracted. But the real biotest to show that this compound is responsible, you take a filter paper and you um, apply a little bit of this natural product. And then if you are lucky, these insects are arriving. And this is uh, the, was the big success. The, the story was kind of closed now because the circle was closed. We had this compound. We showed that these um, milic bugs are attracted. And um, so if you go now to the phylogeny of the aeroids, just we just focus here on, on this little part because um, this was um, in another paper where they, um, where they plotted here the different pollination systems that I was talking about in the beginning. So flies, beetles, bees, and flies and beetles together in red. And you just focus on the, on the yellow. Um, a lot of them are beetle pollinated, but especially in this um, late Caladie, all species known also in Syngonium and all related, they're all pollinated by beetles. And also the ancestral state here is beetle pollination. So when we found this one Syngonium species to be myriad bug pollinated, this was quite new. It's also the first myriad bug pollination system. Um, myriad bugs are um, known to also visit flowers and and harm flowers, even some crops they can harm when they insert the, the, the proboscis, the rostrum into the flowers, they destroy the ovules and stuff. They can also have some pollen on their body maybe, but they were never known to be real pollinators. And especially this was the first specialized pollination system on myriad, puck, on myriad bugs. Um, and here, the second part of this drawing, um, which a friend of mine made. So here you have the first story, you already know. And now there was a change, an evolutionary change to the myriad bugs where the several floral traits were evolving. You have now pollen that is spiny without pollen kit, adhering to the bugs, which are attracted by the scent of a new natural compound in the morning hours. And his food bodies are absent here, you have there, and the plant bugs are in the pollination chamber and no scarab beetles are attracted. So um, this was a pollinator shift to a form of florivore, which, have, which has led to changes in the floral morphology, the pollen morphology, scent chemistry, thermogenesis, timing of antesis. So, um, why is this so important? It is because if you um, go back in time now and you think about the evolution of insect pollination in the first place, there are not so many um, hypotheses, but the most um, and, and the most uh, important are that insect pollination actually evolved from herbivores that started eating pollen and ovules. They had the rendezvous site there, they were eating this stuff. And from these herbivores, um, which are then called florivores, so herbivores on flowers are florivores, they turned into pollinators. When these plants, um, when they, they started to visit the same plant species again and again, and the, the pollen was somehow evolving so that it sticks on the, on the, on the body of these florivores and some floral scents, um, evolved to attract them to, to be sure they visit the same species again and again. And then another, another uh, hypothesis is that from, from carnivorous insects that choose ovules and pollen instead of other insects on flowers. So this would be uh, the two main hypotheses how insect pollination evolved. Then um, you need to ask yourself, um, Oh yeah, then, so you, you have in the, in the fossil record, you, you have a great snapshots of the history of, of pollination also. You sometimes find like beetles on, on, on cycads, for example, they are covered with pollen in amber, or you find pollen within uh, a fly. So all these um, um, ancient insects that were present during the um, 
evolution of the angiosperms, which is a main event on, on our planet, is that there were like beetles, flies, heteropterans, some moths around already on these flowers. But um, it is hard to see like this evolutionary process based on the fossils or phylogenetic reconstructions, because you might have only like a glimpse what you see, you never can be sure what happened and how it happened. So actually a shift from a long past floribory to a pollination where insects visit the same plant on a regular basis is, is nearly impossible. You cannot really show this main hypothesis. But in this case, um, which I showed you now, you have a, a beetle pollinated plant lineage where floribores were omnipresent. So this is the first example where you really see that in, in, in a plant clade, you have like floribores everywhere, which are only floribores and no pollinators. And through this shift to floribores by all these changes in um, floral traits. So the plants are actually adapting to these floribores and this is how it probably happened um, several million years ago. So that's uh, why also this paper, which is now a paper where I can finally finish my PhD, is, uh, was um, also published in Current Biology because all these things together summed up, made a nice story. So you have this new uh, natural uh, compound that attracts these floribores. You, you have the first myriad bug pollination system discovered, and you have a story that really um, made uh, a, nice, a nice story uh, that is, is the evidence for the recruitment of floriborous plant bugs as pollinators, like the um, talk. And it, it, it's interesting that also the science um, news <laughs> They, they grabbed this up and they wrote like plant turns suspected crop pests into pollinator. So they wanted to make it even better, but it was, uh, it was between Neanderthals <laughs> stories, which are very important always there. And that time also uh, last year, COVID was still a main thing. So it was not so easy to get into this news flash here, but this story made it in and that I was very proud of, of course, because I've worked several years on this system and starting from a little discovery of plant bugs being somewhere else to, to this story. So um, I want to show you um, a little summary uh, of this, which I made um, as a video. Can I just escape here? Yeah. Where you see more um, moving, moving stuff. So I hope the, the audio is good, like a um, five minute video.
So thank you for your attention. And also thanks to my um, supervisors and people who gave me money to go there all the time to Costa Rica. Thank you very much. Have any questions? Of course, I will answer them. Yes. Um, nice talk, very interesting system. Uh, I was hoping you showed that phylogeny with the whole uh, uh, the errors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, how does it work for these traits that you were highlighting that are the traits that had to evolve within the genus? Do, do you closely related flowers have some of these traits? You mean in the genus Syngonium? Yeah. Yeah, so of course, so all, all, all so far known other ones have the traits that are um, known from the scarab beetle pollination systems. And only in these species that I, I know already another species also that has this. So it seems that in Syngonium, in the genus, um, there is one like one strand that changed into this plant bug pollination system traits. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering if all of these traits were put together only in this species, or if some of them are already present in the crows. Ah, okay, okay. Um, well, so I only know ones that have the one set of traits, and the others, they have the completely other set. I have no, you are um, referring probably to in between species yeah. that have food bodies. And I mean, it, it, it looks like a little bit in the species that I showed with these little strands that it's not such a big mass going on there. And um, you find, for example, in, in Philodendron, in another genus, you find species that are flowering later at night, almost the, the last one I found at 4.20 in the morning, producing the scent like almost like one hour before it's getting the morning. So, but in, in Syngonium, I, the only thing I could think of is like the, the pollen is getting less um, sticky, but I would need to do um, a in genus phylogeny, which you know it's it's not so easy in plants um, if you have money yes but then uh, to see really which is the sister species of which one and how this tree um, branches out that would be a future project maybe yes please uh, I was actually interested in the thermogenesis in the influences that you uh, mentioned is it known uh, how the heat is produced well yes it's um, it's known because um, there were um, studies that uh, measured stark in the beginning before and then afterwards so these these spadixes are full with stark as always uh, starch sorry starch yeah and um afterwards it's almost gone so it's kind of a process where um they're briefing all the starch but not you uh, not producing atp in this case but uh, um getting rid of it in, 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 in terms of heat. It's actually, it's a similar process how we can heat up our body. Most of it uh, is in, in, the, in the cell producing ATP, but some of it through a special path, pathway is producing heat. Only animals can do it and some plant families are known for it. Also in palms, in side cuts, you find it in quite some older lineages, also in, uh, in water lilies, you, you find this thermogenesis. Yeah, I would be curious in the insect side of this interactions. So do you see um, some kind of co-evolution going on in the bugs? Is it always the same bug species that end up, end up there? And are those ones also um, feeding on other species of plants? Or are they really like specialized for this one plant? So, um, good question. <laughs> this is also a, a thing that uh, should be done now because um, I know that these bugs in, 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 the, in the forest where I work, you have about like 
six of these bug species specialized on these aeroids. And at least I only find them on these aeroids. You don't see them hanging around on other leaves or other flowers. I don't know what they are doing in the, in the canopy. So they might be somewhere else as well, but it seems like they are always um, specialized on these aeroids. And if you um, look at other studies in, in, in South America, if you watch some pictures from Gottsberger in the eighties when this was described. So you always see um, some kind of red black bugs. So there are for sure some species specialized on some of these plants and we have to, done some uh, preliminary um, studies where we use the fluorescence of different species at different times of the day. And then you see a, a change. You see species that are more active in the end of the night or during the day. They go for specific compounds only and others are only at the beginning of the evening between six and nine. And this, um, this black one, black, more black red one, um, is not attracted by the, by the scents of the beetle pollinated species and vice versa, the beetle pollinated species are not attracted by the scent of this one, even not at night. So there is for sure some um, um, specialization in these bugs for certain plants, certain times of the night. Yeah, and a follow-up question to that, do you know maybe how do their ranges overlap, like how widely distributed is this plant species? And would you expect to find the same pollinators if you go somewhere else? Yeah. This is also a, a, a thing that is still not known because most of the studies, also like mine, is done in one area. And uh, you have sometimes the same plant species in different areas. So you would have to look at the same species at different areas, and then you will probably find other pollinators because these beetles, for example, all have, don't have such a wide range, most of them. And then... Um, the hypothesis is now, if you have here a biogeographical study, that you might find even species occurring in different regions, um, adapting to the scent preferences of the local beetle community. Because it's different in Brazil, they have different scents. Um, this is something I'm, I'm doing with a colleague from Brazil and Colombia, where we see a little bit that um, different generally scent compounds are used by the plants there. And so now we are tackling this question, if, if there's one species on different places, do they change in the scent or do they still have the same scent? Maybe they change in the time of the, of the scent and this could lead to different interactions, of course. Yeah. And hey, Flo, can you hear me? Oh yeah, Connor, hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at least online here <laughs> how's it going man uh, very nice talk good job thanks very 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 proud to see that 12 years after our research project project in borneo like one of us turned into a proper scientist so very good um i have a comment or kind of more of a suggestion like from the you know you're saying only five percent of these species have been studied and i guess you know it's even less for you know species in the canopy and in Papua New Guinea, we have the, the canopy crane. So I can I can see I can see you in the canopy crane. You know, we send you up in the canopy crane for the evening with a tent, a few beers, a few tins of macro, and you do your thing out there. So I think that's that's something that we should explore. And uh, you know, we can have a chat with Voita, who's wow. there, because uh, I think that's perfect for you. Like I, I'd imagine nobody is working on this in Papua New Guinea, and especially like uh, maybe you know, but do you know other people that are working on, on canopy species? I saw you were using the ladder. So like, you know, the crane might be a bit safer. Yes. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good suggestion and good question. There are several species also high up in the canopy, which of course I have not studied. Um, I have, interestingly, I have found one species which usually grows at 40 meters. Um, I have found it on a, on a fallen tree. Um, it, it was flowering and it has a different scent than all of them I know in the lower canopy or in the, in the, on the, in the ground. Um, it was one, one, uh, one, three, five trimetoxibenzene and it also attracted some of the bugs, but not a beetle, but should be a beetle pollinated species. So maybe there's also, um, stratification 
niching here going on where you have beetles only in the canopy. But yeah, I'm I'm also sure um, crane would be good. And in in PNG, uh, you have also a lot of um, um, canopy or at least climbers. I know how how high they are going. Epipremnum, um, Raphidophora, and and such genera. Actually, of those, like there's nothing known at all. I think. I mean, there might be some some studies from from Malaysia or so, but even in the canopy, you would need Unding, if you remember Unding, <laughs> yeah. climber, to set up something up there. It's so high. The, 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 the forests are also much higher than in Central America, you know, from mm -hmm. like almost like 30 meters higher. So I'm mm -hmm. a little bit scared up there, but <laughs> maybe if you set up the some beers, this is the, <laughs> the train with a, so <laughs> yes. Cool. We'll make it happen, man. Good job. Yeah. Great talk, man. We Sorry will. you couldn't be there. A pity that you're not here, but we will um yeah, we yeah. will follow up on this. Yeah, 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 for sure. Thanks. Cool, Connor. <laughs> I'm happy he'll at least watch the online talk. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't miss it. Yeah, any more suggestions or questions? If not, I'm thank you that I could be here and thanks, yeah. Okay, there is okay, there's a big pizza. Yes. Yeah, and, and if you have time at six o'clock, it would be nice to see some of you for a good Czech beer or some food. <laughs> <laughs> the main reason I'm here. <laughs> cool. Okay, so you have your or something. I have it there. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.